Um, so, uh, it's come to my attention, are my slides up? Maybe not. It's come to my attention over these past couple weeks that some of you may have not been able to watch Stranger Things quite yet. So I need to take a quick poll. How many of you in this room have at least seen one episode or more of Stranger Things? I did my homework, John. Great. <laughs> have you read Romans yet? Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> okay, okay, so a majority of you have. This is good. Um, but some of you still haven't. I, I, I was asking my Bible course this week, uh, of, and I was surprised how many have not seen this yet. What did you binge watch over the break? <laughs> Please do not tell me you chose The Crown over Stranger Things. Or maybe, as I think I heard in one of my Bible courses, rewatching Parks and Rec. Yes. No! <laughs> That's the show, but nonetheless, Stranger Things. It is something that you need to watch. Now, I'll be very brief and specific in my description of Stranger Things, not to give anything away, mainly about the characters. So, But I do have to give thanks to my wife, because she's the one that introduced me to Stranger Things. Really? Yeah, and it was very strange because she she took a trip to Texas to visit her family, uh, and I had to stay back. And she watched Stranger Things all by herself every night. She was gone in Texas, and she comes back and she tells me, and she knows I'm quite picky about shows. I would say picky with uh, yeah good taste. She would maybe say snobbish, you know, something along those lines. And she said, John, you're gonna really enjoy the show. I know you will, for many reasons. But for one of them, they allude and speak of Lord of the Rings in it. So you're gonna like it. So I watched it, and yes, I loved it. So, thanks to my wife. So I thought I would, yeah, bring up a picture of my wife. Well, that's not <laughs> my daughter. Uh, this is our most recent family photo that our friend took of us. Uh, yes, and so thanks to my wife, she, uh, we'll, get to the, we'll get to the sea monster, sorry, out of order there. Um, very thanks to my wife, because I do, I, I thoroughly enjoy this show. However, I probably need to justify, right from the get-go, of why I'm bringing Stranger Things into Doxa. Why am I doing this? I'm sure some of you are kind of questioning this, and maybe questioning whether or not I'm a dubious character that I should not be listening to. <laughs> and here's my quick justification for this, biblical justification, right? I'm going to give you some proof text, even though this is a terrible way to read the Bible. <laughs> I'm going to give you some proof text right now. One Old Testament. Um, if you know, the Hebrew mind is often one that is a picture mind. Right? So they don't just describe what it is, but they, they develop a picture of what's going on. And so if you're stubborn, you're not just stubborn, but you're stiff-necked. Right? If, if you're not just trying to call out to God, but you're pouring your heart out to God. And so let's read, really briefly, a psalm. Psalm 47. And this psalm, just a couple verses, Psalm 74, I'm sorry, 74, just verses 12 through 14. Yet God, my King, is from of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the sea monsters on the waters. <laughs> you crushed the heads of Leviathan. And you gave them as food for the creatures of the wilderness. Now, I don't imagine, and this is my picture, oh, not that one, sorry. The Leviathan, the great Hebrew sea monster. I don't imagine many of your moms or dads read that psalm to you as a nice Bible story before you went to bed, right? Hey, little Johnny, don't worry about going to sleep and having any nightmares, right? God is your king. 
He's going to crush the sea monsters and tear them to bits and feed them to the beasts of the world. Not quite, right? We didn't quite go there. But yet, nonetheless, right, the Hebrew picture of God being the rightful king over all the earth displays such imagery. Kind of strange, right? Okay, quick New Testament. And I'm not going to go there, but I'm just going to explain this one because it's kind of well known. But it's when Paul, Paul steps into, in his missionary journeys, in the book of Acts, and it's in Acts chapter 17, where Paul gets to Athens. And Athens, at this point, they've never heard of the gospel, they've never heard of Jesus or his resurrection, and so Paul is talking about Jesus and his resurrection. And the Athenians are responding with, what is this man blabbing about? These are strange themes. That's a quote. These are strange things we hear. So it's not that far of a jump, right? To go from strange things to stranger things. <laughs> so let's go there. Oh! Oh, wow. Stranger things. That's good exegesis right there. In the Netflix original, Stranger Things, four adventurous kids, these guys, you may know them as Dustin, Mike, Lucas, and Will, along with another enigmatic kid, the mysterious Eleven, <coughs> embark on an unusual journey. This journey uncovers another hidden dimension, connecting a small town in Indiana with a shadow world, a world they term in Stranger Things as the Upside Down. An ill-defined dark world that is mysteriously connected to our world. This upside-down world has the unfortunate habit of unleashing frightful veil of shadow-like creatures, otherwise known as the Demogorgon. Right? So why? Why have so many enjoyed this show? Right? It's won a lot of awards. It's well liked. Uh, there's probably many reasons, but you know, one of them, yes, many my age who were born in the '80s. I was born in the '80s, mid '80s, and. <laughs> and grew up in the 80s, I'm not that old, right? No, um, and I love this show for right, its sentimental value, right? It brings you back so well to that decade, which rocks, right? <laughs> and, 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 you know, right, like, oh, you remember the day when we just got on our bikes and rode down to our friend's house and just chilled in the basement playing our games and listening to the 80s music? It was killer. <laughs> and so the sentimental value is high. And yes, many watch it for its intriguing storyline, that version on sci-fi, mystery, drama, thriller. It's very unique in that sense. However, I think people enjoy this show for a much simpler reason. And I would describe it um, as it reminding us as the, of the mystical charm of childhood the mystical charm of childhood. It invokes a, a deep desire to regain a story of life that enmeshes and enfolds our lives in every way into it. A mystical charm of childhood. And in a way, you could say the world of Harry Potter did the same thing for adults and kids alike. <coughs> There's actually a lot of similarities if you think about it, right? The world of Harry Potter had two different worlds that were connected. The muggle worlds, right? And the, the world of the wizards. And they were uniquely connected, right? The wizarding world definitely had a lot of impact on the muggle world, even though it was hidden, right? The muggles were not supposed to know about it. And there were gates or connecting points. The alley with the pub and nine and three quarters. Unique connection points in which these worlds collided. And so it's still very similar, right? The mystical charm of childhood. Now, caveat. Within many of us, right, especially those who could ever so slightly be described as a millennial, millennial uh, there exists a troubling desire to kind of resist <coughs> responsibility or resist growing up into adulthood, right? And even within myself, right? Maybe I converge on the millennial age. And, right, the mystical charm of childhood, when I say that, I definitely don't mean that. And I don't mean this kind of uh, adolescent illusion. However, 
I think if we look at Stranger Things, clearly these kids, even though they may be very childish in some ways, these kids definitely are not kind of turning away from responsibility in life. In ways, you could argue, they're actually waking up to what responsibility looks like in this world based on this greater story that's enmeshing and enfolding their own story. So it's, it's, they're waking up to this new um, way of being in this world with a fresh desire to be active and responsible agents in this world. And so here's how I say, see this in the show. And again, I'm going to keep it pretty basic, but also describe enough so that those who have not seen it will understand. I would say the show in, in its characters displays a continuum. A continuum of, you can describe it a lot of different ways, but I'll, I'll say um, the, the narrative of childhood and the narrative of adulthood. And on this end, clearly you have these guys, these four kids. And these four kids, right, they, they live in this narrative because they clearly depend upon stories that make sense of their worlds. Which invigorates, though, invigorates their imaginations towards what is possible in this world. In other words, they're not stuck in a reduced vision of this life. Right? They're not stuck in some kind of flat, reductionistic view of this world. Now, on the other hand, you have this couple. It's kind of hard to see this. But, right, who, who's this? The parents of my, right? One of the kids' parents. And there's some epic scenes, especially of the dads. It's, it's really sad at the same time, like just picture perfect, right? They're kind of the symbolic um, parents of middle to upper class suburban America. And they clearly live kind of in a reduction, reductionistic view of the world where and there's a couple scenes, too, that are really good in, in kind of describing this. Actually, early on in the first season, there is this moment where all the kids are in the basement playing Dungeons and & Dragons, and they're really into it, right? And then Mike's mom opens up the basement door and says, Mike, it's 15 after. Get up here. And Mike comes running up and says, but mom, right? Like, we've been planning this game for two weeks. And I, we didn't know it was go for 10 hours, but we just, we just need a little bit longer. And, and her mom says, Mike, we have a schedule to keep. Your sister needs to go to bed. And this needs to happen, and dinner's almost ready. And then he goes into the living room to ask his dad, and his dad's kind of fooling with the TV, and like it's not working well, so he's frustrated. And he's like, Dad, just a little bit longer. And his dad's like, son, what did your mother say? You know, that's it, right? And then he turns away at this point. Right? So there's the world of the basement in which their story is quite large. And they're being drawn into that story, and they're making sense of their world through that story. And then there is the story, which is quite reduced and simple, right? They, they have a fixed um, mortgage, fixed income, they have the house, right? They have their jobs, they have their schedule to take care of. They have issues with the TV to take care of. They don't have time for silly games or maybe silly stories, right? This is their life. It's fixed, and it's rather reduced. So this is Mike's parents, you can say, on the completely opposite ends. There are worlds, and they are stuck in a world that has been reduced and fractured. Meanwhile, we have a group of characters that fall, you can say, somewhere in the middle. And they kind of are naturally in the middle because they're in the process of leaving childhood and entering adulthood. They're the teenagers. You have a couple of different relationships going on. So you have Nancy, right? Steve. Yeah, I love Steve. Steve is great. His hair is incredible. Um, classic 80s. But, so you have Nancy and Steve up here and then Nancy and Jonathan, the teenagers. And they're in this natural process of leaving childhood behind, right? And becoming an adult. Um, will they, as teenagers, kind of unwittingly drift into adulthood? Or will they 
uncover these new mysteries that call them into a greater story and renew their imaginations towards life. Now, I think you actually see something really cool in just these two pictures. So you have Nancy and Steve here. This is early on in the season. Right, they're in their high school, they're drinking their milk, <laughs> they're kind of lost in themselves right now, just enjoying the simplicity of life. And then over here, a little bit later on in the season, you have Nancy with Jonathan, and they're in the woods, walking through the woods. I don't know if you can quite see, but she's got a gun in her hand, and he's got a bat. Clearly something has changed. <laughs> Especially for Nancy. <laughs> but again, it's describing the larger picture change, right? These little details wouldn't change unless Nancy all of a sudden has entered into a larger story. That now she's had to change the direction and the disposition of her life. And she is doing that. And Jonathan, although at the same age, right, as Steve and Nancy and others in his high school, has not grown up in the same kind of cul-de-sac, suburban life that Nancy grew up in, where it was secure and safe. Jonathan has not had security or safety in his life. And this is not giving too much away because the first episode is like entitled The Missing of Will or something like that. Will is missing, and that's Jonathan's younger brother. So in a way, he's forced into this story. And he hasn't grown up with a lot of security or safety around him. So he's willing, he's pretty willing to jump right into it. Where Nancy, not so much. Steve, definitely not so much. And so this is the makeup of that middle ground. And then lastly, the last character, Jim Hopper. Yes, the Hopper. Which I've, I've received some compliments lately that I kind of look like him. Oh yeah. <laughs> you know, I'll take it. I like I like Hopper. It's great. But he, early on in this year season, he plays the disillusioned drunk. He's a disillusioned drunk who has been bruised by the harshness of the world and seemingly stuck in its reduced vision of life. However, Starting with the unsolvable case of Will's disappearance, he arguably undergoes the most drastic transformation from a disillusioned adult into a reimagined character. I'm, I'm really trying not to get too much away. A reimagined character that is now open to life and its fullness, you could say. There's this one point in season two, and it's a very simple moment though, that it kind of expresses what Hopper has had to go through in ways, but his great humility, right? He's an adult, in a way, re-entering into a greater story of the, that makes sense of the world, that adults typically don't do. He's sitting in the car with Eleven, who is a kid, just like the other, the first four, and he's kind of remarking on his struggles, and he's sitting there and he's saying, you know what, I've made a lot of bad mistakes and I've been and he's searching for the words. Uh, he's like, I, I, I've been, and then 11 goes, stupid. <laughs> and he goes, yeah, stupid. She has this short little moment, but an expression of his own humility to realize that his life up to this point has been rather stupid. And he's re-engaging now into this greater story and becoming a key character in that story. It's a beautiful moment, especially when you know exactly what his background is, which I won't say. <laughs> <laughs> so in my humble opinion, Stranger Things is such a delightful story precisely because it has a strange way of inviting us into the mystical charm of childhood. It reveals, on one end, how dull, dry, and reductionistic our vision of life can be in this world. By contrasting it with a mysteriously vibrant world, or a story that unveils greater truth about our worlds. In other words, this story opens us up to the mystery, and thus the glory 
the weightiness, the significance of life. And it's in that point that I think this story can be extremely helpful for us as we think about the story of God. G.K. Chesterton, a great Christian author, a prolific author um, in the earliest, early 20th century, and, uh, based in London, England, he says this, the life of man is a story, an adventure story. And in our vision, the same is true even of the story of God. So what is that story, though? What is the story of God? And so I want to run through this fairly quickly just to think about this in these terms. The, the ancient church, the early church of the 2nd and 3rd century, and its leaders, and just generally what the, the information we have from the early church in the 2nd and 3rd century, we see a framework of the story of God in this way. Creation, incarnation, recreation. Creation, incarnation, recreation, which I think is a very important framework to hold on to. And the first basic observation that we see in just seeing that framework is that the Bible clearly does not operate with a dualistic worldview that separates and categorizes and systematizes the spiritual from the material. That kind of functions with a religious department and a secular department. God is not merely, therefore, the God of heaven and the souls, and not of the worlds. Not, he's not over just the spiritual life of prayer and devotion, over the physical life of activity in this world. C.S. Lewis would wisely say, in this way, first quote from your Christianity. There is no good trying to be more spiritual than God. God never meant man to be a purely spiritual creature. That is why he uses material things like bread and wine to put the new life into us. We may think this rather crude and unspiritual. God does not. He invented eating. He likes matter. He invented it. Right? So it turns out that God is very much interested in this world in which our lives take place. It turns out that the gospel, centered around the life of Jesus, is a message about Jesus being Lord over all creation. It turns out that God has revealed himself through and within his creation. It turns out that God's focused attention is upon this world. And I think we are far too often operating within a modern, reductionistic view of the world that constantly fragments and bifurcates and reduces the world into merely material things and thus, the spiritual world is the higher, ultimate end to our lives. But the story of creation, incarnation, and new creation will not have it. It will not have that at all. The story of creation in the Bible stands as the vision of life. The vision of life as it ought to be. It's given precisely because our experience of the world is not that way. And so the story of creation is the vision of life as it ought to be. God is communing with his creation, and in particular with his image bearers. And all creation acts as a means or agent of his presence. I once heard a farmer put it this way, that plowing, playing, and praying all had the same purpose of communing with God. All aspects of life, whether you were plowing, whether you were playing, or whether you were praying, had all the same purpose, was a means to communing with God. That's the creation story. But yet, that's not our experience, so it's the vision as it ought to be. Second quote up here from Alexander Schmimmen, other than having a killer name, is a killer theologian. And he says this in the second quote. 
Um, all that exists is God's gift to man. And it all exists to make God known to man. To make man's life communion with God. God blesses everything he creates. And in biblical language, this means that he makes all creation the sign and means of his purpose and wisdom, or presence, I should say, and wisdom, love, and revelation. However, right, this vision is definitely marred. It's paralyzed, you could say, by sin and death. And that's the backdrop of most of Scripture and our lives. The pesky parasite of sin twists and distorts all creation. So Alexander Schmemann will go on to say, in this last quote, Man has loved the world, but as an end in itself, and not as transparent to God. He has done it so consistently that it has become something that is in the air. It seems natural for man to experience the world as opaque, and not shot through with the presence of God. Things treated merely as things in themselves destroy themselves, because only in God have they any life. Thus you could say, consumption for consumption's sake will consume mankind to death. Consumption for consumption's sake will consume mankind to death. Thus, the incarnation is supremely important because it is the unequivocal embrace by God of humanity and of created things. The incarnation, Jesus' life, through which God is faithfully, or faithful, I should say, to his purposes for creation. And through the incarnation, Jesus' life, God is victorious over sin and death, living in perfect communion, right? Jesus in the flesh, living in perfect communion with the Father. Thus, lifting us out of our consumption with death and into participation in his life. John 6, Jesus puts it this way at the top. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I will give for the life of the world is my flesh. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. Again, the Hebrew mind, right? A picture mind. No longer consuming and therefore communing with death, but now consuming and communing with life in Jesus. Thus now, consumption for communion's sake will transform mankind to life. Recreation, the end of this framework, is God's doing again work that renews all creation as the place of his communion, beauty, and goodness. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is the sure sign that God is doing it again. He is recreating. He has begun renewing the material world. That's why it's extremely important that the early church really defended that reality. It was not some kind of mystical Jesus that rose from the grave. It was the physical Jesus, whose body was the first of all of creation to be remade. Thus, John, the Gospel of John, Second part there, 11 and 25, Jesus will say very clearly, I am the resurrection and the life. And this is in the context of when Jesus is about to raise Lazarus from the dead. And if you remember the context, Jesus hears that Lazarus is sick and then dies. And he doesn't just stroll in saying, Oh, guys, you know who I am. I've got this. No, he comes into this scene mourning weeping with his friends who are weeping over their friend's death. Why? Because death does not belong. It ought not to be. 
And Jesus proclaims that he is the one that is to be the resurrection. And he shows that by raising Lazarus from the dead as a symbol, as a token, that this is going to happen to all of life. But right before he does it, he says the second part in verse 40. He says, did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? What he's saying in this moment is that my death has so reduced our vision of life that we don't see it shot through with the glory of God. But quite literally, behind all of the physical reality is God's glory. Whether we see it or not is another thing. And Jesus is saying, I've, I've entered into the world to reveal to you that it is shot through with the glory of God. Yes, there is a problem. And I'm dealing with sin and death as I march forward in faithfulness through the cross and into my resurrection, into my ascension. But did I not tell you, he says, that if you look to me, you would see the physical world shot through with the glory of God. And he raises Lazarus from the dead. Paul, then, will say something very similar in the same vein. He says to the church, to believers in Jesus, and we all, with unveiled faces, right, that the curtain has been or drawn back in Jesus, we see that this reality is true. That death does not have the last say, and therefore consuming the material goods is not life, but yet it is shot through with the glory of God. With un an unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, we are being transformed into the same image, from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. And again, a little bit later on. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself. Glory is being restored in creation. Starting with Jesus, and now through Jesus, into his people as they gather. And one day, all of creation will be covered yet again, shot through with the glory of God. Jesus' life opens, you could say, another dimension. The dimension of the kingdom. God's glory. Alexander Schmemann will, yet again, wonderfully say something to that end. Our entrance into the presence of Christ is an entrance into a fourth dimension. And he explains that now. Which allows us to see ultimate reality, the ultimate reality of life. It is not an escape from the world. Rather, it is the arrival at a vantage point which from which we can see more deeply into the reality of the world. G.K. Chesterton, yet again, will say it this way. We Christians accepted the story of God, creation, incarnation, recreation. We accept it, and the ground is solid under our feet. And the road is open before us. It does not imprison us in a dream of destiny or a consciousness of a universal delusion. It opens to us not only incredible heavens, but what seems to some as an equally incredible earth and makes it credible. I love that. Right? Standing from this vantage point, the vantage point of Christ and his kingdom, it remakes how we view everyone in this room, those in South Boston, those around the world, those from any corner. It remakes the way that we see the physical earth. It changes everything about how we approach our lives. As the poets and priests Gerard Manley Hopkins will say in one of his more well-known poems, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. In Stranger Things, right, the world may be charged with the upside down, with the shadow worlds, a mysterious dark dimension. 
But in God's world, it is quite clear, quite clear, that it is charged with his glory, his new creation power, his resurrection life, and his kingdom reign. Now, to live in this story, we must reject a reduced vision of life. It tells us the world and its life itself is a commodity we own. Now, what would cause us to believe that life is a commodity we own and just to be used until it's all dried up? I think the Bible would call that pride. But see, pride closes us off from the mystical charm of childhood, and it closes us off from glory that is around us in God's new creation story. Pride has a pernicious effect upon us, gradually enfolding us into its view of the world. Right? We've got our hands, we've got feet, we've got minds. What else do we need? The cheerful illusion of modern man. Chesterton will say again, this is my last quote, <coughs> Enjoy him. Uh, Chesterton will say again, pride dries up laughter. It dries up wonder. It dries up chivalry and energy. Are you struggling to laugh at the world, at yourself? Are you struggling to wonder at your future? then pride may have its grip on you. Now, are we living in God's story? Are we open to the glory of God's new creation? Or are we perniciously enfolded into a reductionistic view of this world? With little imagination for God's transformative work in your own life and in the life of those around you. Now, that's a hard question to answer for oneself, right? It's very difficult 